Wrestling Perspective is back and live. Both of us, myself and Petey Williams, home in North America. I didn't go anywhere, but Petey was in Mexico City doing some impact tapings. Petey Williams, welcome home, my friend. Now, how's she going, eh? Going good. Let's talk. Before we get into, and I've got a lot of stuff to talk about with you. All right. Before we get into the main event, the brass tacks, the heavy hitting, how was the tapings? You're home now. What what can you say about the tapings? Uh, the tapings were good. Um, we were in Mexico in the same place. Uh, you know, we had uh, bigger houses than last time. Um, you know, like in Mexico, um, the uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's it's different down there when it comes to the fans. Like, um, for example, if we say the show starts at like eight o'clock. Um, people don't show up right at eight. Like it's, it's kind of like, you know, when they book shows down there, it's like, Oh, you know, if show starts at eight. It usually starts at like eight thirty nine, kind of deal. Um, which that's just their norm down there. That's what they do everywhere. Um, so, you know, we were getting late started, uh, you know, each night, like probably like eight forty five ish by the time we got everybody loaded in there. Um, it, what, what's, what's weird though, is it's also the norm. If a show starts at eight, the doors are supposed to open two hours ahead of time, which is six, which I don't understand because everybody shows up late anyway. So, um, so th- this is all kind of, you know, uh, it doesn't happen this way in the U S obviously, or Canada or anywhere else, but in Mexico, that's how they do things. Did you guys, um, form, did you guys format the show different as like, all right, so yeah, uh, a little bit. We'll, so um, we'll have a couple of non-televised know, matches to keep the people entertained that are there. And then at a certain time, then we'll hit the music. Um, well, no, cause we have a lot of, uh, since we do four weeks of tapings, we have a lot of matches to get through. Mm-hmm. And also the norm in Mexico is they don't usually see over six or seven matches in a night. Like that's their limit. Um, and we're, we're probably doing about 12 matches or 12 segments that we have to film in front of the people. So that's, that's not, they're not used to that, but the way we format it is, you know, obviously we will film out of order. You know, sometimes people are on. If they're wrestling every single show, we have to give them a break in between. Um, so it's kind of out of order a bit, but on TV, obviously, it, it plays out like we intended it to. But, you know, we'll put guys like, uh, you know, the the luchadors that are like the big, you know, big names there, like, um, you know, Pentagon and Phoenix. We'll, we'll try to put them on last, even though they may not be last on you know, they might be opening the show when you view it on uh, Pursuit and Twitch, but we'll put them on last for the crowd because, you know, that's that's their hometown boys. Like, the crowd just loves those two. Those two. They're the biggest independent stars in Mexico right now, or biggest stars in Mexico, I should say. Let's get into some brass tacks here before, you, like I said, we have a lot to talk about. Number one, the one thing I've been asked the most this week I believe it's the second week in a row now. We've seen your Canadian Destroyer finally on WWE TV. I don't know about you, but the first time I saw it, I was kind of shocked. I'm like, wait, wait a second. Did I just see that now? And and I went about. This week, Ray did it again, Ray Mysterio. And it was a blatant Canadian Destroyer. And you, with the new, uh, I don't want to say nudity, but the risque of the women that you were starting to see this week. You had uh, Mandy Rose seduce Jay Uso in a uh, what could have only been ripped out of the pages of the Attitude Era, where she's scantily clad in a hotel room and gives him the key. He shows up, blah blah blah. Then on Monday night, you had the Alexa Bliss segment where someone walks in to tell her he's got her coffee, and she's standing there with, you know her hands over her two good friends which you know starting to indicate that they may be going to more towards a riskier show with the introduction now of the canadian destroyer which was banned in the wwe let's start with the canadian destroyer and how you felt i mean what was the first because i i know you don't watch it live you go back and you'll watch raw and smackdown in your free time what was the first text coming in or tweets that you got what what was your reactions when you they started rolling in uh, i mean my initial reaction was um a couple things i was like well i, I knew this day would come i just didn't know when right because you know we all know like you said pile drivers can destroyers which the pile driver that that's been banned in wwe for like uh 20 uh, around 20 years i would say um 
So nobody's been allowed to do them. And, you know, so I was like, okay, this, this day has, has come and I knew it would. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if it would come this early. I thought, you know, at least like maybe Vince McMahon would die before, you know, somebody else took over and said, yeah, pile drivers are okay now. Um, so that was my initial reaction. My secondary one was, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well he did it. Um, he's not using it as his finish. So he's, he's using it as a throwaway move. Um, and I'll, I'll give a prime example. It, it doesn't really matter what move you use as a finishing move. Like it doesn't like, I, I know a guy that used to wrestle for impact. His name is Cody Diener. Um, people might remember him from, uh, some years ago, he teamed up with ODB, but he does a lot of, uh, indie work and he usually main events, like all, you know, indie shows that he's on and his finishing move is the DDT. Right. And there's probably a DDT on every single match before he goes out there. But nobody cares when, you know, other people do the DDT. But when he goes out there, people are chanting like DDT. And when he hooks it up, the people are like coming on their feet, you know. And um, so that that's the thing. Like the thing is with Ray, he just used the move as a throwaway. Right. Like what, what I do, the move, I always try to set it up to make it important. You know, like this is it. When I hook it, people are like, "Oh, here it comes!" You know, all that kind of stuff. He just kind of does it. So it's going to be that move, and this is a big deal. Like that move, you know, it's it's been around for like sixteen years. I, I've been doing it sixteen years, and it debuted on TV fifteen years ago. So um, since it hasn't been on WWE, I would think like, "Oh, the day it was on, it would be like a." Uh, a bigger deal instead of just like, Oh yeah, I just did this in a move and it's not going to be over. It's just now it's, it's just another move to Ray, um, which, you know, he, I just don't think he's utilizing it. Right. And that's fine. Like his six one nine move is more over cause he got that over. Right. Um, did it make that, you mad? that was my initial reaction. Does, does it make you mad the way it was used and the way it was thrown away? I, I cause it kind of made me mad cause I watched it and I went, really ray i mean you're you're one of the greatest wrestlers of our generation you have a plethora of moves and here you are doing the canadian destroyer without any fanfare without any build-up it was he might as well have just done an arm drag there yeah no exactly or a head scissors whatever the case may be and but you know what he's not the first one to to do that to the move like um it took a while because when I first started doing it, you know, people weren't lining up to take it. It was kind of like I had to work to get the move over. Then once I got it over, a few years later, you know, it would pop. Somebody would do it on the indies or whatever the case may be. And it would just be like, you know, in the middle of a match, no big deal, like or beginning of the match. Like it was nothing that people don't care because, you know, you're just using it as a throwaway move. You can literally have any move as a finishing move. Your finishing move could be an arm drag. Or I'll give you a good example. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. You know, it, when he hit the ring, like, let's say uh, he used to work for Ring of Honor. Uh, and he had, like, a little feud with, I think it was Punk, maybe. And when he hit the ring and he hit two arm drags on Punk, oh, my God. The, the place went nuts because that's Ricky the Dragon Steamboat's, like, uh, trademark thing. Like, he was awesome at doing an arm drag. Just like spine busters you see all the time. But Arn Anderson, you know, with his spine buster, people still go nuts when he does it. So it's all about how you do the move. Like I could go out there and I could do whatever moves I want, you know. But like, it 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 doesn't it, it won't it won't mean anything unless you you know you build it up and and work around it. Um, so yeah, I mean he kind of threw it away. If that's what he wants to do, so be it. Um, but I the biggest point is, you know, and I I was getting a lot of slack on social media because. You know, I would say stuff like respond to like when Ray used the Canadian Destroyer. People are like, um, like just just giving me the negative comments. And I'm like thinking in my head, I'm like, I don't think people realize the significance of what happened two weeks ago. That was like the like the Canadian Destroyer, a pile driver was banned for over 20 years, 20 years in the WWE. And now you saw it. Like, that is a huge, like, milestone, like, in, in, in wrestling, in WWE. Like, it's it's huge, and I don't think people see that uh, that way. They're just like, oh, okay. Um, and, I, I mean, that, that's, that's all I'll say about that for right now. 
what and you don't have to mention any names did any industry uh, not insiders but in you know wrestlers or guys that work in any of the offices reach out to you when it happened like holy cow did you see that or i can't believe he did this no i mean we talked about it at the tv tapings and uh people were just like hey, you see ray do your move and i'm like yeah and i mean they're not shocked because you know, like, for example, Pentagon, who works for us, he does my move all the time. I think he actually did it at the pay-per-view um, in Nashville. Um, Which you talked like, about. What's that? Which you talked about on the podcast. I did? Okay. Yeah. So, and then, you know, Phoenix has used it before. Like, a, a lot of people have thrown the move away and used it. Like, it's a, it's an overused move. Um, which is, you know, I, I find as a, as a compliment to me. I mean, I, I feel that imitation is the best form of flattery. Um, but no, I mean, there, it was no big deal. Like, Oh, can you believe that he did that? It's like the, the more, the more important point was like, you knew it was inevitable. It was going to happen sometime. It was a matter of who and when, and, and pretty much how it was utilized. Um, I find it strange because, you know, a guy like Adam Cole, who's in NXT, he used that, um, as, as his finishing move. I think he had a submission as a finish in ring of honor. Um, but he used also that as a, as a finishing move, um, the Canadian destroyer and, you know, they didn't allow him to use it in NXT. So, I mean, um, you know, it, it's interesting to see if, you know, like Vince even realized it was a destroyer, like it, it was a, a pile oh. driver cause it was so flippy. Like, you know what I mean? Like the way they got into it, it was kind of like disguised a little bit, um, because they do reverse Rana's all the time. In NXT, like, I mean, that's that's almost like a overutilized move, um, which is even more unsafe than a Canadian destroyer. Uh, but guys are doing that all the time and um, they don't say anything to them. So it'll be it'll be interesting because I didn't even think of that if they just snuck it in to see if anybody was watching or if if it was an OK move or if they just went off script on that. And he did it twice. So it I've got to believe that it is it's been okay to do now i don't know how that conversation went down let's let's move on uh you did talk about the impact locker room and talking to the guys backstage i just wanted to get the pulse look it seems like all elite wrestling has dominated everything our podcast you know internet twitter it has been the the cat's meow right now this is the first time you've really been with the guys in, in the Mexico City tapings. What was the buzz backstage about All Elite? There, there wasn't really any uh, talk about it. Um, you know, just like, I mean, the only person that I kind of asked was Jimmy because, you know, obviously he got fired from WWE for taking that picture with, you know, the Bullet Club guys. And just like we discussed in the podcast, like, Jimmy was truthful. He's like, no, you know, these, these guys, I'm, I'm friends with them, but they didn't reach out to me, you know, like Jimmy's having fun doing his impact stuff and, uh, everything. Um, so, I mean, there wasn't really any talk about it. Like, just like we don't talk about, you know, WWE when we're back there, it's not that we're like, it's forbidden. We could talk about whatever we want. It's just that our main focus, uh, when we're down there on impact is putting together our show, and making our like best show, you know, possible. Um, that's what we're doing. And, you know, a lot of the boys get involved and, in, you know, the talent and they look out for each other, making sure that, uh, you know, we're not doing like, uh, duplicate finishing moves and all that kind of stuff. And the agents do that as well. But, uh, like we're, we're, we're there and we're focused on our product and it's, it's very difficult because, you know, when you film raw, you're there, uh, it's, filmed in order live so you already know what's going on uh, a lot of the stuff like when we're down in like in mexico it's it's filmed out of order so we have to like kind of go and look at our formats and be like, all right what we did last night is that going to air before or after what we're doing tonight oh that's going to film after so we're filming in reverse and all this kind of stuff so it's a lot of work down there so we don't really have a lot of time to be like um you know talk about everything else that's going on in the industry can we introduce a new segment this week? What's the new segment? The segment's going to be called Dennis Tries to Pay Off the Ridiculous Mortgage on His Brand New House. 
Yeah, sure. How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, if you go to BlueChew.com and you use the promo code WPP, you see where I'm going here? Yeah, I, I knew you were going to say that, but yeah. I set you up. See, I'm a good setup you guy, not are. just you. You're, yeah. un, you're an underrated setup guy. But, <laughs> but uh, look, I bought a new house, and uh, <laughs> maybe I have buyer's remorse. The wife loves it. It's uh, Wow. It's Did you see the pictures? I did. Very, uh, very good get on your part. Very beautiful house. I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, checking it out when I'm over there. Um, you did good. It's yeah. no, it's no PD Williams compound, but it it's got a nice big pool, so you and the family can come swim, and mm-hmm. we can all hang out. And it's got a little pool house, and everybody I've showed it to goes, "Oh wow, is that a uh, community pool?" It's like, no, it's in our backyard. Which, truth be told, I'm not a pool guy. Like, I am not a lounge by the pool. Uh, you know, if it's hot outside, I want to be in the air conditioning. I don't want to be sitting out by a pool. That's that's who I am. But now, it's like, now I'm going to have to adapt and overcome and change who I am because now I got a GD pool, and I'm not really excited about it. But this house, this pool, ain't going to pay for itself. So you guys have to go to BlueChew.com. Use the promo code WPP. That that promo code you get for free, a free shipment of Blue Chew. In the Blue Chew, all you have to do is pay five dollars shipping and handling. That's five bucks, PD. Five That's bucks, good. yeah, five bucks to them is a happier life for me. Do do you guys yeah. do you see how the economics work here? Yeah, so I mean, uh, if we get a hundred thousand dollars in Blue Chew sales, I mean, you should be able to pay off your mortgage. Half of it. Well, not even half. <laughs> not even half. That I, yeah. I, I, I'll put a dent in my mortgage. Yeah, it, it would be a good, uh, great down payment. It, yeah. Look, the kid's not going to college anymore. We've given this up. So we're going to start teaching her how to flip burgers and maybe start brainwashing her that, hey, you know, community college isn't so bad. Community college is not bad. Or, you know what? Be very smart and get good grades. You know, get your scholarships and you don't have to worry about like paying for school. That's that's the way you gotta that's the way you gotta do it. I didn't even think of that. Hey, go be good at something so I don't have to pay for school for you. Exactly. I'll train her to be a professional wrestler, then she'll be golden. Look, whether you're a boy or a girl, Blue Chew will make your uh, let's say late night main event at the end of a great date or your marriage or just whenever the kids are gone. It will make your late night main event that much better. Trust me, if you're a woman and you know you love your husband, he fixes things and maybe he has some abs and your house is beautiful and he works hard, but let's just say uh, he's a mid-carter at best in bed. You know, you, you get the order of blue chew, you elevate him up. He is essentially like the Jinder Mahal of your bedroom, right? Jinder Mahal? You... you... You, oh yeah, because from the mid card to the main event, yeah. I was I was wondering why you were referencing gender of all people. Well, gen- um, gender went from jobber to champion in like a month. Or you could be like uh, Mustafa Ali, Ali, who went from uh, two hundred five live to like you know wrestling the world champion Daniel Bryan. So you, one of those two. That's oh, a good reference. I, I, that's a great one, by the way. Or you could go from being Dennis Farrell to Petey Williams in bed. Oh, that's even a better reference. I mean, that's like tenfold better. Yeah, I, I know because I've went from Dennis Farrell to Petey Williams in bed when I use my <laughs> blue chew. So I know exactly what it's like. Maybe men, maybe you're going out with a woman who's just way out of your league. And we've all been there. You get the girl that's a little, way more attractive than you deserve. Uh, look, I've been there. I've dated some really good looking women in my time. And you get in the bed and you're just a little bit too excited. Hey, Blue Chew will help you Can keep your composure when you are on the big platform, when you come out on the big WrestleMania bed stage. So go get the Blue Chew. Enjoy your evenings together. Because, look, it's made from the same active ingredients as Cialis and Viagra. It's chewable, which means it works twice as fast. I pop one in, chew it up, take a shower, come out, and I'm ready to go. I look like, you know, Triple H or an Attitude Era with the wet hair all soaking wet and Looks like he's just been sprayed down before he came out to the ring. That's how I look when I'm ready for bed, minus the muscles. That's good. And then you hit the hit the ropes just like Ultimate Warrior, shake it all up, and then, well, it's not over as quick as his matches. Maybe the match he had at WrestleMania six with Hogan, but that was a longer one. It, 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 you know, without Blue Chew, that's exactly how it is. But with Blue Chew, <laughs> I'm putting on a 60-minute man Iron Man match for the championship. 
You hear Ric Flair Woo. in bed with the 60-minute right. Broadway. Yeah, that's right. So go to BlueChew.com. Use the promo code WPP. Look, I know there are some people sitting here listening to this now Go, I don't need Blue Chew. Hey, that's fine, but I need you to order the Blue Chew. So order the Blue Chew. You don't even have to use it. Put it in a drawer. Hide it away. Throw it away. Do whatever you want with it. I don't care. It's none of my business, but it is my business. Go order the Blue Chew for us. Please, because, you know, this mortgage payment ain't going to pay itself. Hey, a little bit of insider. Yeah. When I told Jimmy Jacobs that we were sponsored by Blue Chew, he said, yeah, I ordered some of that. I'm like, whoa, Jimmy Jacobs. Wow. Maybe it, that's why he writes such good television. <laughs> well, that's why he's up so late. Yeah, exactly. That's why he doesn't need any sleep. And also, if you go to whatforapparel.com backslash WPP, you can get some really cool wrestling perspective shirts. We've got a couple really neat NWO style shirts. Uh, we got some logo shirts of the show. We are going to add, as uh, soon as the artwork gets done, uh, you know that comic book cover we've tweeted out and I've shown you? They're, yep. they're going to add the, uh, the font for wrestling perspective above it like a comic book. And when that's done, we're turning that into a shirt. Oh, that's gonna be a that's gonna be a good shirt. Oh, th- that is such great artwork, isn't it? Yeah, that was that's that's some pretty like uh, it looks very professional. So yeah, I'm excited for that. So go to whatforapparel.com, get a shirt. Uh, if you tweet PD or myself with the shirt, we will definitely give you a huge shout out on the show. We appreciate any time. Anybody goes and spends some money on us and helps support the show. So uh, whatforapparel.com backslash WPP. You go to bluechew.com. Use the promo code WPP. Get your first shipment free. And uh, you pay $5 shipping and handling. So hopefully my house will get paid off after this podcast now. <laughs> hopefully. So that's what I'm going to do. From, from here on out, anytime it's time for us to shill something, it's going to be called Dennis Pays Off the Ridiculous Mortgage on His House. There you go. That's 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 what it is. Hashtag. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not sure that's the right use of the hashtag. Oh, it'll be fine. Let's move on. Uh, Dave Bixenspan, I think his name is. I don't really pay too much attention to him, but he is a, I want to say maybe with Sports Illustrated or D- Deadspin. I'm not sure. Big wrestling fan tweets out stuff. And he tweeted out something really interesting, Pete. And I want to read it to you because okay. – this is something I feel like we need to discuss. Here's his, here's his tweet. Um, since it was suggested by at BJ Middleson, suggested this. AWE's owned by a billionaire family. Ring of Honor by a giant broadcast TV group. Impact by a cable TV station group. Lucha Underground and uh, AAA, a consulting group. MLW, a VC backing I don't know what VC backing is. Uh, Evolve, Progress, uh, Insane CW, uh, WXW, or WWE affiliates, they are not indies. Okay. Do you agree with that statement? That that all those organizations that I just read off should not be considered independent wrestling? Um. Yeah, if you look at it, so I'm trying to think of like an independent group. Um, let's take, I think Danny Daniels up in Chicago. That's a pretty big one. I think it's called AAW, I believe. Mm-hmm. So that would be considered uh, an independent organization because uh, Danny owns it. You know, he might have some like, you know, money backers. I don't know. I haven't talked to Danny in a long time. Um, but it, he's not owned by like all those things you mentioned, like a consultant group, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a cable company, a TV network, a billionaire, all that kind of stuff. Like, so that's why I would call them independent. Like they are, you know, they, they either are going to succeed or fail based on their own dime and what they book. Like, I'm pretty sure Danny doesn't have to go, you know, up to the powers that be and be like, um, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. No, it's, he has the creative control over it with these other companies. Like, you know, I know when we're, when we're on pop TV, um, you know, with the network, uh, there were some things you couldn't put on, you know, the TV based on like their demographic and what they can and can't put on their, their television uh, channel. So, you know, I wouldn't consider 
impact like an indie promotion, even MLW because they're owned by somebody in AAA. All those things, Ring of Honor, they wouldn't be considered indie. And it's not just because they have a TV show. Um, because, you know, I, I'm sure AAW, they, it might be broadcasted on some sort of cable access. That's a TV show. But th that's how you kind of have to to look at it. Like, what's backing you? Um, th that would that'd be the best way to start, I would think. Would Destiny be considered independent? Um, yes, I would say so. Even though they're on the Fight Network mm -hmm. or Fight TV, whatever the American version of the Fight Network is. Um, I, you know, they might pay to be on that. Um, or maybe they don't get paid to be on it. It's just kind of like, you know, here's our product. Um, but they're not, I, I believe they're not backed by like a big like corporation or anything like that. Would border city wrestling be considered independent? Yeah, because, um, that like Scott Demore owns that it's his own, you know, independent thing. Now, when we do stuff with, you know, impact and we do TV tapings there, we'll say like, you know, we're, um, in cooperation, however you want to put it with border city wrestling. So a lot of these Twitch shows that we do that are just like just Twitch, not our, our impact TV show. Um, we'll say, you know, impact on Twitch, um, you know, associated with, whatever it is, border city wrestling or, or this company or this company. So it's just that we're, we're, we're promoting that company for them. Um, because we're using like their arena, their ring, uh, some of their talent and all that kind of stuff. And we're kind of mixing it into an independent show or an impact show. So border city wrestling, yes, is a, um, an independent promotion. All right. Cause I, I saw this and at first I was like, what are you talking about? And, and then as I kind of thought about it, it's really right if you look at it. People consider or lump Ring of Honor as an indie promotion. They they lump Impact in as an indie promotion. A lot of people are talking about All Elite Wrestling being an indie promotion, but they're anything but. These are corp. These are you know wrestling organizations backed by multi million dollars, some maybe even billion dollar corporations. Yeah, th th I mean, that's the way you got to look at it. Like, independent promotions don't have, like, uh, like a president, vice president, like, CEO, COO, uh, treasurer, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, a, a PR guy. They might, but on a very small scale. You might have one guy doing, like, six of those jobs because it's on such a smaller scale. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't rank any of those as independent promotions. I definitely wouldn't. So... Just because they have or they're run like an independent, because let's be honest, uh, Impact probably is what financially set up for the next five or so years, but they are running their business almost like an independent. They're being very, I don't know if frugal is the word I can use with their finances in, in the talent. They're not having a big roster. They're contracting more people to come in and out for extensive dates, but not long-term contracts. That's... That that reeks of an indie promotion there. Um, well, it's uh, it. I would say it's a sound business model. Like, um, you know, obviously they're gonna have a core group of guys that are, you know, their guys that they uh, can utilize on the posters and help, uh, you know, do PR stuff like radio shows and stuff like that. Um, and and that's that that's good. But uh, to have like everybody under contract and all that kind of stuff and just kind of monopolize them and like tie them up it, it, it's not they understand that it's not beneficial to them nor the wrestlers because the lack of dates that we do i mean we're not doing four shows a week uh on the road like wwe is um ring of honor they do a lot of dates you know they're they're gone every weekend every other weekend something like that plus they have their tv taping so they can lock up their guys because financially it's it's beneficial for the company and for the wrestler. For us, you know, at Impact right now, it, it, it wouldn't make sense. I mean, the contracts would have to be a lot lower, but you can't tie up a wrestler um, for that long. A, lo a lot of, you know, the contracts might be like, hey, here's our upcoming dates. You could do, you know, whatever other shows you want, but, you know, we're going to sign you for like, I don't know, nine dates. Here's our next nine dates that, you know, we need you at. Okay, sure. Um, or whatever the case may be. Would you say... Uh... And switching gears a little bit since we're talking about impact here, 
would you would you say the the vibe in the writers room cuz you're part of the office now for impact was there any talk about worried about what uh talent will stick around and what talent may go to all elite because let's be honest these guys are are changing the way the game is done they're doing a lot of exclusive contracts which it's kind of smart uh, you, you're seeing a lot of talent now in the WWE ask for their requests, uh, their their release. Ziggler has taken Dolph Ziggler off his Twitter account name. He's going by his real name. Uh, a lot of people say he's done coming up soon, and he could be all elite bound, which that muddies the water because I think he's doing a comedy tour also. You have um, The Revival, who asked for their releases. They've gone as far as taking their names off of Twitter. There's heavy rumors there, and they were the butt of the jokes or, you know, going back and forth with being the elite. Are You know, you see WWE panicking. You're seeing a change in their programming, at least from this week, and I don't know if it will continue to move forward. What are you guys doing? What is What are you guys saying? Um. Well, the thing is, and I'll kind of not quote Tommy Dreamer, I'll paraphrase Tommy Dreamer, uh, he was talking about like the best, the, the great thing about ECW was guys left all the time. Like that's, that's what was great. He said, you had your roster, a, a guy would get pushed to the top, whatever. He'd be around for a little bit. And then he would get signed by like WWE or WCW. He would leave back in that era. Um, and then guess what? Somebody else on the undercard had to step up and then they stepped up. And then guess what? They left for WCW and WWE and then somebody else had to step up so you know it's I would say it's fine because you never know who's you know gonna step up to the plate like right now we have like our top guys and an impact let's say if somebody leaves for whatever company you know that means that somebody else has to step up a good example of this is uh you know just at the tapings um I was watching uh the rascals the rascals is uh Trey Miguel Zachary Wentz and uh, Desmond Xavier. And, you know, one of my favorites now is Trey Miguel. I think he just goes by Trey, but he's like the singles guy in that group. And then uh, Des and, uh, and, and Zach are, are the tag group and they're, they're both great too. Um, but Trey was having phenomenal matches with guys that, you know, haven't had a lot of singles matches, but it was probably like their best singles match with the company uh, because they're a wrestling Trey. So Trey's like one of my new favorites, I would say. And he's really good, and I could see him stepping up. But if guys weren't leaving, like, I mean, obviously, you know, Trevor Lee just left. Like, wh- whoever else is leaving, that leaves an, uh, another spot on the roster for somebody else to step up. So I, I would say it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it sucks when you put a lot of time into somebody and then they leave the company. Okay. Um, but somebody else is going to step up, and it, that's that's totally okay. And it's going to make it the product fresh, um, and it does it won't get stale. Um, so I'm okay with that. What does the Matt Seidel injury do for you guys in, in writing forward? Was he at the tapings? No, he wasn't at the tapings because, uh, um, I think he got injured right before the tapings. Like, I think it's so, cartilage in his knee, if I'm correct. Yeah. So, and I think he said he'll be back in what, uh, March or April. So obviously that means he won't be at, uh, uh, the Vegas tapings, unless they use him in a non-wrestling role, something to build him back up. I, I don't know. Um, but the, you know, our March tapings will be at the end of March. I don't know if he'll be ready for that. I can't remember what he said, March or April. He'll be, he'll be ready to go. So, you know, based on the surgery, it looks like it's going to be uh, like a scope, um, which is a, a quicker recovery time. Um, so and I remember like when uh, Christopher Daniels, like he got a knee scope, like, a couple weeks uh, prior. And then I wrestled him like on an indie show. And he said, yeah, we just have to stay away from doing this, this, and this because of my knee. And he, he wrestled like two weeks later. So it depends on the recovery time, uh, you know, what they have to do in there. Um, but, you know, Matt's really flexible, uh, like flexible, like his body is oh, flexible. I've seen it. He, he, you yeah. know, this is one thing we've never talked about. And Seidel is one of those guys where, I've seen him at a ton of tapings. I've never really interacted with him, but you watch him and he's very meticulous with the way he stretches. And it seems like he's out stretching two hours before the show even starts. Yeah. And he doesn't want to talk. I have wrestled mad a lot of times and I'm like, 
Hey Matt, you want to talk about this? Like, let, let me stretch. And I'm like, okay, well there's 45 minutes at least. So whatever. Um, and, but yeah, he's definitely stretching all the time. He takes care of his body. Um, so I would think he's going to recover faster, uh, than most people just because of, you know, his flexibility and stuff like that. Um, and how he takes care of his body. Now, you know, he is getting older. He's not in his twenties anymore. Um, so does that have an effect on your recovery? Yeah, absolutely. But, um, I, I think, you know, his recovery will go well, um, as long as the surgery is done correctly and, uh, you know, he should, should be back before you, we know it. So let me ask you this now with him being out, you've been, you've not been on TV in almost, it feels like six months. It may be longer, it may be shorter, but several shows uh, you're you're loving your new role as an agent and a producer and a booker and a writer. You you're loving what you're doing. Does this force you back into the ring now to fill that spot on an already kind of thin, not talent wise, but just body wise roster? Um. Yeah. yeah obviously, Matt had a, a lot of like name value. You know, with the company, a lot of people know him all over the world. He's been all over the world. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be time where, you know, I'll, I'll probably get back in the ring um, just, you know, to get some name value, uh, you know, back in like the X Division or on the roster. Um, and, and I'm OK with that. Um, you know, I do like my current position. It's great. I love it. Love doing it. Uh, if I have to get back in the ring. OK, sure. I, I know it's not going to be a forever thing, um, but it, it's been about, I, I think, four months or so that I've uh, showing up on TV. Our next t- tapings is February. And I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, I had some sort of active wrestling role. Do you, did it break your heart? Because it broke my heart and I broke my heart because a, I'm a friend first. And uh, you, you talk about these ultimate, and we haven't talked about this on the podcast. So this is the first time you talk about the ultimate X matches like it was the greatest time in your life. It was like you were the captain of the football team and you won a national championship or, or, or whatever. They had one at homecoming. You were not part of it. Was there a part of you? Look, and at, sure, you have to pass a torch eventually. I get that and you get that. But was there a part of you that was heartbroken that you were not involved in that match? Um, You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of I like watching those matches. I'm not a huge fan of participating in them. They're, they're very dangerous. Um, I was talking to a lot of the guys like uh, that that wrestled on that you know, pay-per-view in the Ultimate X match, and they said, man, I was up there, and man, it was scary. You know, and I rem- remember my first time. It was all of their first Ultimate X matches. I remember my first time. I was a little scared. Um, but then, you know, you, you get used to the match, and you're like, yeah, I've been up here before. You know, anytime you do the first thing, I remember my first back bump in the ring. Um, I was scared. Now it's like, I don't even think twice about it. Uh, so, you know, I understand that fear, but they went out there and they delivered and, uh, great. Uh, so I wasn't upset because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of actually participating in those matches cause they're, they're very difficult. Like, it's not like a regular psychology match. It's, uh, it's equivalent kind of to a ladder match, but you don't have the ladder prop to work with. It's like, you gotta, there, there's no pinfalls. There's no submissions. It's, it's it, it's kind of it's kind of tough. Uh, in a way, though, I've never gotten uh, like in regular wrestling matches. You know, I get kind of blown up, like winded, like out of breath and stuff like that. And all the X matches, uh, since you're taking like bigger bumps and stuff, I don't get winded because you're doing a lot more selling rather than a lot more movement because of you know just just the the, the nature and the psychology of the match. Um, but no, I mean, I wasn't. Uh, I, I was I was totally okay with not being in it. Did uh, did any of the guys reach out to you for advice? Um, no. But beforehand, uh, you know, with the Ultimate X, I was kind of describing to them, you know, what it's going to be like and stuff like that. Uh, and I said they would be fine, just assuring them. Uh, but that was like well well back, like in. Uh, I think like November. So they had a lot of time to prepare. Um, we already knew who was going to be in the match back in November because we filmed everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I knew they were going to be fine. And uh, to wrap up the show, what have we missed that you want to talk about? Or is there anything we haven't touched on that you feel like we should bring up to end the show? Um, 
Well, just, I mean, a couple of big points uh, at the last tapings, like one match that uh, was like really, really good was uh, there was a street fight. Um, I don't know when it's going to air, uh, probably like in, uh, maybe it, may, it might be like six weeks away that it airs. Um, actually, not six weeks. It might be like four weeks away. Um, it was Tessa versus Taya, and it was a street fight. And man, they they gave her like it was it was really really good. And uh, like they both delivered. Uh, it wasn't like one wrestler carrying the other. Like they both delivered. They both gave her. It was it was really good. So I was really proud of that match and what those two uh, accomplished in there. Um, and as well as, you know, there was a big, the last match on, uh, the last day, it was the Lucha brothers versus LAX, uh, kind of like a rematch from, uh, the pay-per-view in Nashville. But that match was, was, man, that was really good too. Um, so there's a lot of good, uh, matches coming up, uh, on the next few weeks of, of impact. So just make sure that you either watch it on Twitch or pursuit, um, because uh, this stuff was really good. It really was. Oh, you know what? I remembered what I want to bring up. I set it up earlier in the show and then got away when we started talking about the Canadian Destroyer and WWE TV. Let me throw this out there real quick because I know you have a life and you have to get back to it. Here's, here's a thought for you. As I set it up about Alexa Bliss being a little topless and covering her friends up, then you had the... The instance where you had Mandy Rose in the hotel room, which just reeked of, uh, you know, attitude error writing there, which isn't good or bad. It depends on if you like it or not. We are just, it seems like, a few months off the heels of this big woman's evolution. The, the whole 2018 was bringing women equality up to what the men are doing. And then you air these two things on TV. Does this take away from what the women have been building up to where you basically, you know, treat them again like sex objects? Or is this just part of the women's evolution? Because I watched it and there are two halves. There's the there's the chauvinistic dentist part. Now, be honest. Look, I'm a guy and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. Then there's the part where I'm analytic, where I go. Well, didn't the women just spend a whole year trying to fight from having to do this or be treated like this on television? And I, I don't know the answer as, as a man. And it's maybe not fair, but as a wrestler, and you may have different insight here or your thoughts, do you feel like this is a step back for women's wrestling? Well, no. I actually think it's a step forward because now uh, I feel like they're portraying the women's wrestlers as one dimensional. Now this brings multiple dimensions to them. So for example, you go back to the attitude air, you know, a lot of the women uh, at first were, were not trained, you know, or, or, or they weren't good. Right. And they were just portrayed as, as, you know, sex symbols, like, like you said, like in bras and panties, like they used to in the attitude era. Um, and then, you know, they would try to train them and, and, you know, get them better and all that kind of stuff. But the wrestling was not at par of the men's. Now you look and the women have really stepped it up and it's on par with the men. So you have that dimension right there. So, but it's very one dimensional. Now, if you take them and be like, you know what? They, women are beautiful. All right. So why not say, hey, you know, the, they, they are not only like beautiful and sexy, but they can also kick ass and wrestle as well. So now, now I feel they have an edge on the men because the men, you know, I mean, what are they? They're uh, good wrestlers. The, that, that's it. They're not going to be walking around because honestly, like <laughs> that, that doesn't sell. It never has over the, uh, you know, the course of history, like, you know, guys being sexy, it, it doesn't. So if anything, women have a, a one up on the men now because the, now it can now they're multi dimensional. Okay, it, it was worth the thought because I wasn't sure how how I'm supposed to feel as being a analyzer, being a and I still don't consider myself as an industry insider. I'm a guy that loves wrestling that does a podcast with a very uh, you know famous wrestler in you, by the way. Uh, oh. Just in case you didn't know that, so nope. so I, I I I consider myself still a fan first. I don't know any more about wrestling than anybody else. I just have 
uh, I'm just lucky enough to be able to interview guys sometimes that other people wish they could have. And I'm still a fan. So I guess that's, that's trying to be two different people and think two different ways here has kind of confused me on the way, you know, is it, is it, I like the way you broke it down. I don't know yet if if this is a step back or not. You have to keep. I guess you have to keep watching now because are they are we is the WWE going back to what worked in the day and getting away from the wrestling and away from the storytelling and just showing good looking blondes you know shake their assets? No, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I, I think like uh, I think like Alexa Bliss for example, she's proven she can go in the ring. Right. Mm -hmm. So why not a little bit bad, a little bit of edge to her? Like one thing that we've been doing on impact is with what's with, with Scarlett is like, uh, I think her, um, our, our tagline is like, you know, she's bringing uh, sexy back to wrestling because it, it's pretty much gone. You know, it has been. And I think there still is a demographic that likes to, you know, that they've tuned in for years to watch that. Um, in wrestling and now you just kind of take it away. So I think there is a demographic. I don't think it should be all over the show. Like it was in the attitude era, but there, there could, there should be a point where it's like, yeah, this is hitting the one demographic that wants to see this on TV. Just like when you write like a, uh, a television show, soap opera, whatever, you, you know, there's a serious aspect of it. There's like a, you know, a, like a sexy part of it. And then there's like a comedy part of it. You kind of get, um, you know, the best of everything. And I think that's, uh, you know, I know what we're trying to do at Impact, and it looks like that's what WWE's uh, going back to. All right, what do you have to promote? Uh well, you know, we got uh, we got TV tapings uh, coming up uh, in February, uh, the fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth at Sam's Town uh, Casino in Las Vegas, um, and then we head over back to Canada. I think it's like March. I don't know, like twenty third, twenty fourth, something like that. I, I believe it's a Friday and Saturday. Um, and then I don't know where the April pay-per-view is going to be uh, or what it will even be called. So uh, we got that coming up. And also uh, on Twitch at 10 o'clock and also on the Pursuit channel, you can watch Impact um, yeah, every week. Uh, so nobody should be able to miss it as long as you have the internet. You have Impact. Um, and then you can also find me on Twitter at IPD Williams. Don't forget, you guys can go over to WrestlingPerspectivePodcast.com. You can get the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast. Subscribe to it. It helps the show. You guys can, don't forget, we have a little network with a bunch of great guys over there. Uh, just Google Wrestling Perspective Network. Uh, every once in a while, we'll put up one of our shows over there to help drive traffic there. But it's a great group of podcasters that we believe in will be the next generation. And we want to give them a platform to to have their voice. You know, Michael Berry is over there, Eric Cordova, the guys that the industry should know about and will know about in the future. Uh, don't forget, we are on SB Nation Radio now, heard on over 80, 80 radio stations throughout the United States. Check your local listings or go to SB Nation Radio to find out where and when you can listen to the Wrestling Perspective. Pete, oh, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter at Dennis77Farrell or Facebook Wrestling Perspective Podcast. How's that? Did I do good there? Yeah, that was great. That was a that was a mouthful. I tried. Uh, you almost, yeah. Imagine if you had like all these blue chews in your mouth trying to do that at the same time. Oh boy, I could go all night long <laughs> and into tomorrow. Yeah, nobody will be able to understand you though. Oh, you know we're supposed to get six to eight inches tonight of snow. Uh oh, of snow. Of okay. snow, I mean, of snow. I, I thought that was just the forecast for the bedroom, but okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but global warming hit my bedroom. <laughs> Ain't no snow in there tonight. So, oh, okay, uh, guys, thank you so much uh, for listening to this week, and uh, we'll see you next week, Pete. Thanks, bud. All right, all right.